So one of my brethren recently passed his test and was given a company car. Now my brethren's my age, spent his whole life riding public transport and buses. Every now and then he'll call me up. Jay, what does this parking restriction mean? What does that parking restriction mean? Remember, if you've been riding public transport and buses your whole life, you don't business about parking. It's non-existent to you. Then he was watching some videos about road rage incidents and stuff and he sent them to me. Then he said to me, Jay, why don't you do a video about your driving experience? And I said, you know what? You're on to something, you know. That will be a good video because I've been on the road from day. So from this video, I'm going to talk about my moped experience. Because man jumped on mopeds when I was young. So when I got my first bike, passed my test, I just rode off bikes and cars, got in a police chase, when I've been in a road rage incident, yeah? So stay tuned. So boom, my first moped experience was when I was 14. I was with my cousin from Southgate. And he said, can we go link our cousin from Tottenham? I said, all right, cool, let's go. So we've gone and linked him now and we're chilling in his yard. And he said to us, do you not want to come around the corner and I'll show you some mopeds that I've got? So I'm like, all right, then, cool. So we've gone around the corner to one estate called Park View in Tottenham near Northumberland Park. And in the bush, my cousin had two mopeds just stashed in the bush. So I let you lot do the maths and work out whether or not they were legit. So my cousin's backed out the key and started up both of the mopeds. I was a bit rusty at first, you know, I couldn't get the balance at first, but after a couple of hours, I was starting to get the hang of it, just whizzing up and down on this estate. And I'm like, yeah, I'm hooked now. So boom, next day, back there again, whizzing mopeds around this estate. Gone home, called him up next week. Cuz, coming back down to whiz around on them mopeds there again. Nah, cuz, can't even do that, you know. Why, fam? They've been stolen. Fuck. Although they weren't even my mopeds to begin with, I swear I was more pissed than my cousin. I was thinking, fuck, like, I'm hooked on riding these mopeds now, and now I can't even do that. Like, where am I going to get access to our next moped? A year later, man's 15. It's the summer holidays, man. Yes. My brethren from Silver Street hooked me up with some older man called Magic. He had a moped for sale. Gone to link the man. All he wanted was £150 for this moped. It was an MBK old Veto T Reg. Now, what's an MBK old Veto? MBK old Veto is like the fake version of a Yamaha Neos. Think of it like this you know, we got Vauxhall courses, yeah? Have you ever seen those cars? They look just like Vauxhalls, but they're called Opel. It's the same kind of thing. So anyway, pay the man the peace. I'm 15. It's the summer holidays. I'm gassed. I don't give a fuck whether or not it has tax, MOT or service history. Does it start? Yes or no? That's all I cared about. Now, he was a bit more sensible. He gave me a little sticky note with his full name on it, how much he sold it to me for, the make and the model of the moped and the colour, and then he sent me on my way. I started this thing up and I was gone. From there, it was on. It was over. I was a law to myself. Nobody could stop me. Taking the ped, gone straight to my bridging yard on Silver Street. He's jumped on the ped, breezed it up and down the road five, six times. I'm like, hey, bring the ped back. Jumped on the ped and gone straight towards my house. There's me thinking the moped is like a bicycle. I've gone through Pins Park in Edmonton. I've gone across the grass, the field where the man never playing football, you know. The park units, please, they've seen me. They've turned around their truck and chased after me, put the blue lights on, gone straight through the park and out the park. I knew the police was gonna be on me from then. So I thought, let me call it a day. But just before then, let me go up to the Hartford Road and get some chicken and chips. Arrived at the chicken and chip shop, didn't see no police. Ordered my food, and I'm standing outside the chicken and chip shop, got the moped right outside the front, and I forget, yeah, I'm the man, I've got wheels now. Yeah, no one can stop me, I can go wherever I want, whenever I want. So I've got my chicken and chips, and I thought, right, let me call it a day. I don't want to get this bike taken off me already. Let me call it a day. The police is on me, it's hot. And there's me, dumb dumb, 
I bought the mold pad. I'm eager to get the pad, but where can I store it? Because I can't bring it home to my mum. So near my yard, there's Edmonton Green Shopping Centre and there's a car park. So I just stashed the bike in the car park. The next morning, man woke up at 8 o'clock like I was getting ready for fucking work. Gone to Edmonton Green Shopping Centre's car park and the pet's still there. Good. Jumped on the pet and gone straight to Southgate. Now on my way there, I'm riding this pet. Yeah, I'm having fun. I'm having the time of my life. This pet was slow though. I remember I'm riding on the road and I'm on this moped and this thing's just making a bare noise. There's me thinking I'm riding fast, you know. I look to my right and there's man running and he's keeping the same speed as me. You gotta laugh though. So I made it to Southgate High Street. I'm on my way to my cousin's house. He don't know I'm coming. I wanted to surprise him with the moped. So boom, at Southgate High Street, there's a bus terminal and it's an underground station. Me being lazy, I saw the traffic up ahead and I didn't want to wait. There's me using the moped like it's a flipping bike. I've gone through the bus terminal the wrong way. The police have seen me and gone straight onto their radio. I didn't even make it to my cousin's house. I had to turn back and go straight back to Edmonton. So I had to go back to Edmonton. Couldn't show my cousin the thing, but that weren't gonna stop me from doing any more riding that day. So I'm back in Edmonton. I'm on Bouncer's Road. If you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. I'm singing down Bouncer's Road. I'm in a t-shirt. I don't know about highway code or how to ride safety. I just know about jumping on this moped Revin and gone. I'm riding down the road. There's a man in front of me. He wants to take a right turn. Dum Dum over here decides to overtake him. Bam! My man licked me off the moped. So he's licked me off the moped now and he's just pulled over to the side of the road. Now I'm getting up off the floor and picking up this moped. He's come over to me and asked me, oh, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm cool. I'm picking up this moped, trying to start this moped because I've seen the damage that I've caused to his car, but he ain't. So he goes back to his car, maybe to get some paperwork or something like that, and he spots the damage. I've jumped on this moped and I was gone. So I thought to myself, this guy is more than likely gonna call the police. So let me hide out for a bit. So I made my way towards my mom's house. I was just gonna park the moped at the end of my street, just hide it in a little corner. I'm near my mom's house, then I get stopped by the police. I'm thinking, it's over. The ped is gone. So they pulled me over now and they said to me, they have a report from a member of the public saying that a young man has been knocked off his moped in a hit and run incident. So I'm thinking, okay. You know, the police officers haven't said that I was the person who ran off and I weren't about to tell them I did. So they were just asking me, are oh, you all right and that? And they asked me, did you get the person's registration? I said, no, 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 it was an accident anyway. It was nothing major. They could see that I was obviously okay. The moped was intact. So they was happy to let me go. But first of all, they wanted to take a few details. Boy, this is only gonna go one way, you know. The policeman's asked me my full name and my date of birth. As soon as I told him my date of birth, he looked at me and he said, but you're not even old enough to ride a moped. As soon as the policeman has said that to me, his work colleague comes over and says, I've just done a check on the moped. It has no tax, no MOT, no insurance. He has no provisional and he has no CBT. No one would guess what happens next. So these times, I'm not saying nothing. I have nothing to say. I'm literally like, I'm just thinking, I'm fucked. To make things worse, some next police officers are pulled up. Now, the original police officer that stopped me, he was cool, man. He was kind of like on a good cop team. These next police officers that pulled up, nah, they were on a bad cop team. My man jumped out of the car and he said, nah, you lot have got the story wrong. 
This young man wasn't hit into and the driver fled the scene. He hit the driver and he fled the scene when the driver tried to get his details. They're talking in front of me and they said, well, we're going to have to take the bike and arrest him. The good cop came up to me and said, when did you buy this moped? I told my boy yesterday, I got a little sticky note in my house to prove it. I said to the good cop, look, my house is around the corner. It is a one minute walk. It will be quicker for you to let me push my moped to my house. And I promise you, if you let me go, if you let me push my moped to my house, you will not see me on the moped, rather than having to take me to the police station and fill out all this paperwork, which is gonna take much longer. He said, so your house is around the corner, yeah? He said, okay, get in the car. We're gonna go to your house. I want you to bring me this receipt that you got from the person who sold the bike to you and I want to speak to your parents. So we've jumped in the car and drove 10 seconds around the corner to my yard, literally. So we've pulled up outside my house and we've knocked the door. My mum's opened up the front door and she sees me standing with a policeman and he's basically explained the situation and he said, go up to your room and get this receipt that you got from the man who sold you the bike yesterday. So I overheard the policeman ask my mum, do you know anything about this moped? And my mum said she has not seen or heard anything about no moped. So when I come downstairs with the receipt to show the policeman, my mum's asked me, why are you fasting up yourself and buying a moped when you ain't got no license, no insurance, no tax or no MLT on the moped? I've handed him the receipt and he's looked at it and just shook his head because it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. So anyway, you never guess what. The policeman has looked at me and said, I've spoken to your mum and she seems like a responsible parent. So I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not even going to take the moped from you. We're going to get in the car. We're going to drive back to the top of the road. You're going to take the moped. You're going to push it back to your house. You're going to leave it outside the front of your house. And you're not going to ride that moped again until you have a provisional license, you have a CBT, you have tax, MOT and insurance. I said, deal. So anyway, jumped back in the car, gone to the top of the road, 10 seconds around the corner, you know. The bad cop is standing beside the moped. Got out of the car, the good cop has approached the bad cop and said to him, look, I'm just gonna let him off. I've spoken to his parents, his parents sound like they're decent people, whatever, innit? Nah, the bad cop won't have it. He's like, nah, man, we should arrest him, whatever, innit? He said, nah, we're just going to leave it. We've got bigger things to deal with. And they let me go. Gangster. Jeez. Man, get away with everything out here, fam. I was so lucky to get away with it. You don't even understand. It was mainly because of my mum. If my mum had a nasty nigger attitude, like when the police turned up, oh, you're arresting my son. Oh, it's because he's black. I would have been straight down the cell of Emmett and Green police station. But my mum is not like that. So the police officer thought, you know what? He comes from a decent home. He's got a decent family. So you know what? We'll let him off. So anyway, police man's let me go. I've pushed the moped to my house, chained it to the front of my house. My mum's come out. She was just baffled. Like, why would you want to ride a moped? Like, what's the fascination? My mum don't understand, innit? Anyway, chained the moped to the front of the house and I listened to what the policeman said. I never rode the moped again. But then next month I bought another moped. The following month, I turned 16. So now I'm actually old enough to apply for my provisional. I can get insurance. I can tax the bike, I can MOT the bike, and I can do my CBT. I decided, you know what? I want to buy another moped. But I want to buy a faster one this time. So I bought a Piaggio NRG 125. Again, this moped was not roadworthy. No MOT, no tax. The moped didn't even have a kickstand. I had to lean the moped up against the brick wall in my back garden. So now man's got two mopeds. I feel like a G at this time. I got one at the front and one at the back of my house. Obviously with me having two mopeds, one at the front and one at the back, my mom has something to say about it. This ain't no Ross Clark garage. Take away your bicycle from me, yard boy. But I actually wasted my time and money with both of the mopeds. I didn't even end up riding them. 
when I was checking insurance quotes, it was going to be too expensive. I didn't have a job and I couldn't afford to maintain even one moped. So eventually I sold both of them. My next moped riding experience was a year later. My friend and I acquired a moped. I ain't going to say, but you do the math as to what that actually means. It was a Yamaha Aerox 70cc. Oh man, we had fun riding that moped. We can only ride it at night time for obvious reasons. So during the day we used to leave it in a bush. And at night time we used to just ride it up and down on my estate. We used to have one person who stands at the top of the estate to shout if any please come. And we just spent the whole night just riding up and down, up and down on the estate. We used to do some foolishness on that moped. One time two of my brethren came down to my estate and they needed to go up the road. I said, yeah, yeah, don't watch that fam, man, I'll drop you. I was riding the moped. One of my friends was in front of me and one of my friends was behind me. There was three of us on this moped riding down some alleyway in Edmonton called Mile Alley. The foolishest speech to get up to. But all great things come to an end. My friend was riding on the moped and he crashed into some woman's car on my estate and rolled off the moped. The following year I've gone jail now and I was just only inside for the summer holidays, so eight weeks. And I've come out and I thought to myself, I can't be riding bus anymore. I need to get myself some wheels. So I bought a Galera DNA for one of my cousins. It's a moped, but it looks like a bike. One of my friends got nicked during the London riots. So I went to his court hearing at Crown Court in Wood Green. There I met some Indian girl. After chatting to her for two, three weeks, I was like, come down to Tottenham. I'll pick you up from Tottenham Hill Station and we'll go for a little spin. Man, picked this girl up, went for a ride like a jackass, riding down the alleyway, riding down the footpath on the pavement, just riding like a complete idiot. Do you know what? I actually enjoyed riding that moped. I actually had a good time riding that moped, but I had to get rid of it eventually. It just caused me too many problems. Remember one time, I went down to my grandma's house in Romford. On the way back, the moped broke down three times. I was lucky to make it home that night on that moped. So eventually, I sold it. Shortly after, I got another Galera DNA. It was a 172, but on the logbook, on the paperwork, it said it was a 125. It had a 172 engine inside. Eventually, that Galera DNA started giving me problems, so I had to end up selling it. These Galera DNAs, these Italian mopeds, they just shit. I was sick to death with these Italian mopeds breaking down on me. I thought to myself, you know what? I need something reliable. I need something Japanese. Started looking on Gumtree. I see a Yamaha YZF R125. In the description, it said, you can ride this on a CBT, which I had. There was one boy from Enfield called Jake selling an R125. I had two grand to my name and he was selling this bike for 1,700. So it was basically gonna kill all my money. And I never was the type of person to burn pretty much all my money on anything and leave myself with nothing. But I was desperate to get myself some new wheels. So I arranged to view the bike. So I've called up the ute now and I said I wanted to view the bike. He said he was at football training. These times it's around 7 p.m. But he said he would be available at 10 p.m. I said, look, I ain't got no transport and I ain't gonna go all the way down to Enfield. Can you bring the bike to Edmonton? I'll meet you outside the police station. He said, okay, cool. 10 o'clock's come now, he's called me. He said, yeah, he's outside the police station. So my yard's just like a one minute walk from the police station. Gone to the police station now. I thought he was going to be there on his own. My man standing outside the police station with four of his uncles. They looked like they was ready for beef. I mean, what the fuck are you coming out here with all your uncles and that? Obviously, them lot are from Enfield and they probably thought I was setting him up or something like that. I just came on my own. I just thought to myself, what the fuck? So I've had a good look at the bike. Had a good look at the paperwork. Everything was all on point. Obviously, he didn't let me test ride the bike for obvious reasons. He just rolled the bike up and down just to show that obviously the bike rides properly. 
And I said, yeah, I'm happy with the bike. In a day or two's time, I'm gonna come down to your house and buy the bike off you. Couple days later, I would have just gone down there and bought the bike off him and rolled it home. But the R125 was a manual bike and I didn't know how to ride a geared bike. Although I had a CVT and it allowed me to ride an automatic and a manual 125, I still had no experience riding a manual bike. So I had to call a recovery man to pick up the bike and bring it back to my yard. I knew riding a geared bike wasn't going to be too difficult to learn. It was just a matter of time. So as soon as I got the bike back, every day after that, I would take the bike around on my estate, just learning how to change gears and not stall the bike. Eventually, after about three or four days, I got more confident and I started to leave my estate. So I'm riding around Edmonton. I'm getting more and more confident as time goes on. I feel like that man now. I go back to my yard. My Indian girlfriend's at my house. I pull up to the house. I say, come, get on the back of the bike. Just like when we first met. She's jumped on the back of the bike and we've gone for a spin. Now, when you have a CBT, you don't have a full license. You're not allowed to carry anyone on the back of your bike, but I was. So I'm riding around Edmonton now, gassed, got all the attention, people are watching us. I'm like, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we drew attention to the wrong people. I was just about to go home with my girl. I thought to myself, let me just ride around the ends one more time. Bad move. I've got to a junction now. I'm at the giveaway line. There's traffic police to my right. He's looked at me and I've looked at him. Now he stopped his car to give me way, which he's not supposed to. Now he could tell by the position of my bike that I wanted to turn left. So he said, go ahead. I changed my mind. I signaled him to go across because I wanted to go straight ahead to one estate. All of a sudden, he decides to change his mind and he wants to go to the estate as well. So he's pointing to me saying, I'm going that way as well. Me and the policeman had a conversation without saying a damn word to each other until we decided to wind down his window and say, most people who have full motorbike licenses don't carry passengers on small bikes like that. Pull over, please. Ah, oh, shit. So I've pulled over now. I'm still sitting on the bike. I've still got my girl on the bike. I haven't even turned the engine off. He's told me to turn the engine off and I've stalled the bike. He's like, turn the engine off. I've stalled the bike again. He thinks that there might be a problem with the bike. No, it's just I can't ride the bike properly and I'm trying to get away from him. I can hear my ex-girlfriend behind me saying, Jay, just go, just go. Next thing you know, zing, I've gone. Next thing you know, I'm in a police chase now. Woo, 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 blue lights. I'm doing some madness, riding down residential streets at 50 miles an hour, flying over junctions, could have got into a car crash. I'm leaving the police. There's all sirens, woo, 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 blue lights behind me. I'm leaving the police. I get to one alleyway. I'm just about to get away from the police and zip down this alleyway. Bam! Crash the bike into a fence in the alleyway. It's game over, bro. The bike's conked out and I'm trying to restart this bike. The big policeman's come running into the alleyway. He's grabbed me. That way you fucking are! My man raised his fist like he was gonna fucking box me, you know? I'm just like, yo, hey, it's, it's cool, man. It's cool. So anyway, he let me go, but he was just shouting at me. Why did you run? You could have lost your fucking life. Look at your girlfriend. She's hurt. So she's there limping, limping, trying to act like she's hurt so that we can get some sympathy, hoping that the police would let us go. It was a good try, but they were not having it. They arrested me and they put me in the back of the car. They said to me, we're not going to bother take you down to the police station because it's just going to be a waste of time. But you're not leaving with that bike tonight. We're going to impound the bike. We're also going to give you nine points on your license and you have to appear in court. You know what the worst thing was? The two police officers who were traffic police officers, they ride motorbikes and they knew by the size of the bike, it was a small motorbike. And they knew that I didn't have a license. You know what the police officer said to me? 
He said, we would have just pulled you over and said, make sure you go home and we don't want to see you around for the rest of the day riding around with your girlfriend on the back of the bike. But because you ran off from us and we chased you and you were driving recklessly and you put her in danger, we're going to make sure you get points on your license. These times I even got a license. So imagine I had nine points on my provisional license and I didn't even have a full license. That's why now, whenever I'm doing something I'm not supposed to, I never run away from the police. So they let me go. I didn't have to spend the night in the police cell, but they impounded the bike and I had to go all the way up to Perryville the next day to get the motorbike. And that's where the problem started. When your bike or vehicle gets impounded, there's a daily charge. So each day that goes by means I have to pay more money. So I called up my bridge in that same night that they took the bike off me. Brother, I need you to take me down to the pound in Perryville, West London, so I can get my bike back. Because each day that goes by means that's some more money I have to pay. So it's Sunday, luckily, and my girlfriend was staying at my house. My brethren's picked me up and we've gone down to West London. We've arrived at the vehicle pound. Now there's all these nice cars in the vehicle pound. There's a lot of shit cars, but there's some nice cars in the pound. Range Rovers, BMWs, Mercedes. After 14 days, if the vehicle isn't picked up and the fees are paid, they will crush the vehicle. These police don't fuck around. This is when you know the police don't fuck around. I'm walking around in the pound now and I said, no way. I see a fucking bus. A bus in the vehicle pound. Boy, them don't fuck around, you know. So I think to myself, yeah, these lot don't ramp now. Got into the reception, gave them my details. They start asking me for a logbook and that. I'm like, I ain't got the logbook, you know. I've recently bought the bike. I've had the bike four days. I said to the lady at the reception, all I've got is my provisional and the green slip, but I ain't got the full logbook. It takes two weeks for the logbook to come. She said, no, that's not good enough. She said, if you cannot provide the logbook, you need to provide us with some kind of receipt. You need to get the seller to write you a receipt and send it in to us. It needs to have your name, his name, the bike make, the bike model, the bike registration, the bike color, the date and time of purchase. I'm thinking to myself, how the fuck am I gonna get a receipt from this guy? If he's in Enfield and I'm in West London right now, she said, get him to go to an internet cafe and fax it to you. Luckily, man still had the youth's number. I called him up and I begged him to go to a local internet cafe and write me out a receipt with all the relevant information. Anyway, luckily my man came through. Luckily I fucking saved his number as well. Cause you know, sometimes you'll buy a car or a vehicle from someone, you'll delete their number and they'll probably delete the ad from Gumtree or whatever. Luckily I still had his number and he came true. He wrote out the receipt and he faxed it to the pound and they accepted it. Next, I just paid the money and I got the fuck out of that place for them to come up with some other excuse for them to not give me the bike. Anyway, managed to get the bike home safely. And one day, my bike got stolen. So these times, I'm working for Home Saharangate and I'm based at Broadwater Farm. So I used to ride my motorbike down to Broadwater Farm and leave it outside the community centre. There was a nice lady that used to work in the office. I used to call her Auntie Jen. One day, Auntie Jen's called me up. Jay, do you ride a red motorbike? Yeah. Because some boys have stolen it. Right, I'm coming. We was actually in the middle of rewiring a flat. I'm an apprentice at these times, so I don't have my own van or nothing like that, and I ride around with someone else. At the time, I was working with a guy called Rob. He was in the living room, and I was in one of the back bedrooms. As soon as I heard the news, I went running into the living room. Rob, I need you to stop working right now. I need you to drop me to farm right now so I can get my bike back. My bike's been stolen. On the way to Broadwater Farm, I'm vexed. I'm thinking, I'm going to fucking kill someone. They stole my bike. I'm mad. We got to Broadwater Farm now and we're driving around the estate. Broadwater Farm's our big estate. There's lots of flats and car parks and stuff. We're just driving up and down and we can't find this bike. And something told me. Now imagine Broadwater Farm is like a square. The community centre is in one corner. 
and there's a flat called Rochford right on the other side in the opposite end. We didn't check that car park. So I said to him, Rob, let's go to Rochford's car park. So we parked up the van outside of the car park. And we're on foot now. We're walking through the car park. This car park is an abandoned car park. All we can hear is some banging and some clanking. Sound like someone's hitting metal against metal. So it's just me and this guy called Rob at the time. I'm black, I'm 19, Rob's white, and he's 34. We're walking through this car park. Now I'm walking ahead of him. I see in the corner there's about eight men surrounding this bike. I've turned back to think, like, let's go and call some more man. He's like, no, nah, let's carry on walking. So we've approached eight of them now. I'm like, hey, that's my bike. They start scattering. But a few of them stayed behind. The others started coming back and were outnumbered. Luckily, it was just a talking thing. And I reckon it was just a talking thing because they disrespected me, you know. One of the youths who was like the leader called me a dickhead. Said, you're a dickhead you. That's beef. But... I shouldn't even have been on the estate, period, working, let alone trying to get my bike back because of where I'm from. Luckily, they didn't ask you where I was from because then it would have got peak. I'm from Edmonton and I'm still in the mix of the things, yeah? I'm still gang affiliated. It's almost like a Peckham boy being in Brixton. That's a no go zone for a Peckham boy. So if they had asked me, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Edmonton, it would have got long. And I tell you right now, if I wasn't with an older man, if Rob, who I was working with, the white guy who was 34, if he was the same age as me, we wouldn't have got that bike back. They would have rushed us. It was only because I was with an older man and, you know, most people have respect for their elders, so they just allowed it. If Rob was the same age as me, 19, they would have rushed us. They would have rushed us. There's no way two youths not from Broadwater Farm can go into their area and take back a bike that they stole and there's eight of them and there's two of us and they were just let go. They would have rushed us. So I had to just take it on the chin. My man was running his mouth saying, you're a dickhead, you and that. I had to just take it on the chin. We shouldn't have been there to begin with. Now they fucked up the barrel. What they were doing was they was hitting the barrel where you put the key with a hammer and a screwdriver. I don't know, they were trying to start the bike somehow. So I couldn't even use my key to start the bike. The guy I was working with, Rob, he had a pair of pliers and I was able to start the bike from there. I had to leave work early to get to the Yamaha shop so they could repair the barrel for me. So yeah, I was lucky to get away and get the bike. And I never rode the bike back to Broadwater Farm, except one other time after that. A couple months later, my girlfriend at the time decided to treat me and buy me a new exhaust. At the time I had a standard exhaust and it was pretty quiet on the bike. She bought me a Scorpion exhaust and it was really loud. Here's me riding the bike after I got the exhaust pipe changed. Great boy, take it, get me. <laughs> I must have fucking really Summer nights, white t-shirt, white air forces, you're done now. So the bike used to draw a lot of attention when I used to ride down the street. And lo and behold, I had to draw the attention of one Jobsworth policeman. One morning I was late for work and I was riding past Edmonton Green Police Station. And my bike's loud, you can hear me coming from the distance. One policeman is walking on the street. He turns around and he flags me down. So I've pulled over and he said, your bike is extremely loud. He said, you riding past on a loud bike like that could disturb someone having a picnic. Blood, it's 20 past eight in the morning. Who the fuck's having a picnic at that time? Obviously being the Jobsworth police officer he was, he decided to do a little quick check on my bike. And it's come back that I have no MOT. With insurance, you usually get a reminder when it's about to run out. Back in those days, we had the tax disc. So you would know when your tax is about to run out on your vehicle. But with your MLT, unless you write it down in your calendar, you'll probably forget about it. Some garages who issue your MLT will send you a reminder, but not all. So the policeman said to me, I can't give you three points on your license for not having an MLT. So instead, I'm going to give you a fine. So basically what that means is it is illegal for me as a policeman to give you three points on your license for having no MLT. So instead, 
I will give you a fine. But if I could give you three points on your license for not having an MOT, I would. I said, come on, I can go and get an MOT after work. And the next time you see me in the area riding the motorbike, I'll definitely have an MOT. He said, no, nope, you're lucky. I don't give you a noise pollution violation ticket for having such a loud exhaust. He said, next time I see you riding that motorbike and the exhaust pipe is really loud, I'm going to give you a noise pollution violation ticket. Anyway, later that day, I saw it at the MOT, but I didn't saw it at the exhaust. A couple of weeks later, I'm riding my motorbike, riding past Edmonton Green bus garage, and I overtook a police van. And there was something about this police van. I couldn't put my finger on it at the time. Continue going down the road. Now I've passed Edmonton Green police station and I've taken a left to go towards my house. I see this police van driving up behind me. So I didn't really pay them much attention. I just, I'm aware of them. I've pulled into my estate and they're right behind me. As I've pulled up outside my house, lo and behold, it's the same policeman again. He's pulled up to me, he's wound down his window and he said to me, I thought I told you to sort out that exhaust pipe. He said to me, I'm retiring in November. So after then, you can do whatever you want. But until then, you need to sort out that exhaust pipe or I'm going to collar you. Luckily, I didn't get no ticket from him that time. About a month later, I'm in Edmonton. I'm riding. The exhaust pipe is still loud, you know. I'm at the traffic lights and a police car pulls up to me and it's the same policeman again. He winds down his window and he says, you're so lucky you're a nice chap or else I would have given you a fine by now. And he just drove off and I never saw him again. Fast forward a couple of years now. Still got the bike, but I'm taking driving lessons. Put my driving test four days before my birthday. Been doing driving lessons for about four or five months, getting really confident. Whilst I'm taking my driving lessons, some idiot friend I had back in the day said, oh, you shouldn't take your driving test in Barnet because if you're using a manual car, it's going to be difficult to master the clutch because you're going up and down hills. What an idiot, as if the world is flat and I won't be driving up and down hills once I pass my test. Anyway, man, took the test four days before my birthday and passed first time. Two weeks after my birthday, I bought my first car, a blue Honda Civic 2004, baby. Nothing beats that first car feeling. I love that car, man. That nice leather seats on the inside, had one of them panoramic roofs that move and shit like that. I love that car. Write down in the comment box below what your first car was. And don't lie, I know some of lot is still driving that Volkswagen Golf Mark Minus One. I remember my first official driving that car like it was yesterday. It was one Saturday and I got some girl's number during the day. She worked in a clothes shop. Called her up and said, what, can I come pick you up in the evening? She said, yeah, no problem. Man didn't even have no proper insurance on the car. I've got some silly little tent cover just for the day. Cost like 20, 30 pound, lied on it, said the car was in a fucking garage, said the car was all the way in Kent, said I was 50 years old, just so it looked like I had insurance on the car. Sped up to her house in Enfield, picked her up, picked her cousin up as well. We went to the KFC drive through I thought I was the man. I always wanted to go through a drive through in my own car and I was able to do it. I even had my own personal little getaway driver as well. So months afterwards, man's always outside my house, usually on a Sunday, cleaning that car inside and out. And people always ask me, oh, like, how's your bike doing and stuff like that? Like, oh, you still, you still got the bike, although you got the car. I'm like, yeah. And I think people used to wonder, how can this guy afford a car and a bike? Easy, I know how to manage my fucking money. I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't do drugs. I know them people there is probably sly haters anyway. That's why they're asking, man. Fuck them people there. So yeah, man used to always keep that car clean. I remember one time I was on my estate but on a different street I was outside my friend's yard. It's me, my friend and his neighbour. I'm outside the house and I'm just sitting in my car talking to them. All of a sudden my friend's neighbour's house gets raided by the police. 
A random seven-seater car pulled up and jumped out on us. They were undercover police. So naturally, because I'm with them and the neighbor's house gets searched and I'm outside the neighbor's house, they're gonna wanna search me and my car. So I'd recently cleaned out the car. I'm a compliant person with the police. So when they have approached me, I've given them my car key to show them, look, I ain't gonna run off or nothing like that or try to drive off. Police girl said to me, I need to search your car. I said, cool, you can search my car, but you're gonna search it without putting your feet in my car. I made this police girl put her knees on my seats in my car to avoid her putting her dirty trainers in my car. Cause I just cleaned the car and you're not dirty in my car. She did it, she done it, she had to. Ladies know a boss when they see one. Jeez, done now. Those are actually my bars, you know. I might have to start rapping, you know. Honda Civics are good, strong cars. I remember one time I smashed into a rail and I pretty much rolled off the car. I remember one Sunday morning, I was going to my cousin's house to do some work and the road was wet. It had been raining like an hour before. And I was just gonna emerge onto the A10 from Berry Street in Edmonton. I've turned right and the front wheels have overspun and I've smashed into the railing and rolled off the whole of the right hand side of the car. And judging by the damage, I knew it weren't gonna be cheap to fix, but that was the least of my worries. I've called the recovery man to pick up this car. This car was not going nowhere, it had to be recovered. He said to me, you need to be careful. There's a CCTV camera out there. If they pick up that you smashed into the railing and you've damaged the railing, they're gonna charge you. And it's not gonna be some silly little cheap 500 pound fine. You could pay up to 5,000 pounds to repair this railing. Boy, he got me shook. He told me about one horror story where he was driving outside of London and he drove his car straight into one of them telephone poles and they charged him £5,000 to fix the telephone pole. He said he didn't even have the money. He had to take out a loan to pay off the debt. I remember the next day I went into work and I told two of my older work colleagues, two older man, black man, Ollie and Kevin, about the crash. And I said, yeah, man, the road was wet and I smashed up the front of my car. The wheel spun out or whatever. Kevin said to me, is it front wheel or where we will drive? And I said, I don't know. He said, how can you not know whether your car's a front wheel or rear wheel drive? Ollie said to me, listen, if it was a rear wheel drive, you would know about it. Them cars there, when they decide to spin out, it's like trying to tame a demon. You will be in the front of your car and you can see your back as you're spinning around. But anyway, whether a car is front wheel or rear wheel drive, that was the least of my worries. I was thinking to myself, when are they gonna send me a fine through my front door and make me bankrupt? Luckily, I repaired the car and I didn't get no fine through the door and that was that. Fast forward, it's 2016, I'm almost 24 years old. When I turn 24, that means I'm old enough to take my A2 motorbike test. Once I pass this bike test, I'm gone. Man is eligible to ride any size bike engine I want. 600, 750, 1000, 1200, 1400, you name it. I thought to myself, do you know what? Rather than pass the bike test and then have to go and get a bike, let me buy the bike first and then pass the bike test afterwards. So at the time, I still had my little R125, but I wanted to get the 600 version. So I thought, right, I'll do that. So I looked at one motorbike in Northwest London and I weren't feeling it. And then I found another motorbike, which is in Corby in Northamptonshire. And I went up there and I bought that bike. So now I've got two bikes, one that I can ride and one that I can't ride. I've got one at the front of my house and one at the back of my house. I'm having deja vu. I'm sure I mentioned that earlier in this video. So now a man's got two mopeds. I feel like a G at this time. I've got one at the front and one at the back of my house. Obviously with me having two mopeds, one at the front and one at the back, my mom has something to say about it. This ain't no Ross Clark garage. Take away your bicycle from me, yard boy. Anyway, that didn't last long because I ended up crashing my little R125. At the time, I had a vending machine business at my uni and I got a report that the vending machine, they thought the vending machine was on fire inside the uni and they actually called the fire brigade. So I've gone down there to investigate a day later and it was a false alarm. And I'm riding my bike down Bayswater Road from Notting Hill towards Oxford Street. It's night time and there's a long queue of traffic going the opposite direction. Now in front of me, where I'm riding, the road is completely clear. One idiot in the queue of traffic going the opposite direction decides, you know what, 
I don't want to wait in this queue of traffic. So he does a three point turn as I'm bombing it down the road. As soon as I've spotted him, I've slammed on my brakes and the bike has just skidded from left to right and I've gone straight over the handlebars and I've rolled into his car. As soon as I've rolled into his car, I got up off the floor and I jumped up. Who the fuck are you pulling that in front of? I wanted to fight this guy, but I just calmed down after a while and I just called the recovery people. The bike was fucked. It was a complete write-off. There was no saving that bike. See, that's the situation there where people will say, see, this is why motorbikes are dangerous because they're idiots like him. Right, in that situation, that guy was wrong. You know, he done a three-point turn. He didn't see me coming. Whether he was intentional or whatever in it, he was still in the wrong. But most of the time, when any motorbike rider has an accident, I'm telling you, the rider is probably doing something stupid. Undertaking, man. Popping wheelies. A man might have been riding at the speed limit. It might have been a 70 mile an hour zone and he's doing 70 miles an hour when he gets into that accident. But what was he doing two minutes before? Riding at 120 miles an hour. If he wasn't doing at 120 miles an hour, he wouldn't have been in that position right then and there to get into that accident. So it's easy for people to say, oh yeah, because you know how people are. They don't, no one wants to take the blame for nothing. People always want to cast the blame on someone else. Ah, oh, it's that idiot driver's fault. Now, don't get it twisted. Man a rider, man a driver. I see some bullshit on the road and I'm thinking, God forbid I was on my bike when that person decided to do that. Maybe they did look. That's why they done their stupid manoeuvre or whatever. Maybe they didn't. But I think motorbike riding is only for certain people. It's either you have a passion for it. You've been doing it from young. Like me, man, I've been on mopeds and shit like that when I was a youth. I enjoy motorbike, I enjoy riding, I enjoy the thrill of it. Or you need to ride a motorbike or a motorcycle of some sort to get to work. One of my friends said to me, I want to get a motorbike to stunt in the summer. I said, brother, you're going to end up in a fucking hospital. So now I've only got one bike. I've got a 600 that I can't ride because I don't have a license for, but at least I've still got my car at the same time. Anyway, boom. Few months later, I've taken my motorbike test and passed first time. The best day of my fucking life. A few days after, it was Monday. I done a little naughty thing at work. I drove my car into work. I picked up my work van and drove it around Broadwater Farm Estate to make it look like I was in the van working. I got back in my car. I drove home and I took my motorbike to the garage to get an MOT. Once I MOT'd it, I then taxed it. Once I taxed it, I then insured it. Once I insured it, I took it out for my first official ride. These times I'm supposed to be at work, you know, I'm riding around on my motorbike. It was the best ride of my life. Boy, that new bike feeling, man, you just cannot describe it. About a year later, I still got that blue Honda Civic. Then some dickhead decides to ride off my blue Honda Civic. One night, I dropped off one girl that I used to see in Holloway. I'm making my way back towards Tottenham, Edmonton. There's a guy in the left-hand lane. He's up ahead. I'm in the right-hand lane. I'm attempting to overtake him. Next thing I know, this guy just switches lanes and bam, crashes straight into me. This time, the car was a complete write-off. It was no saving this car. But luckily, I got a nice courtesy car, a Nissan Duke. It was pretty much brand new. It had 14 miles on the clock, 1.4 on the clock. I was pretty much the first person to ever drive this car, and I absolutely loved it. I had a few weeks left until I have to give back the courtesy car, so I decided to buy another Honda Civic, but I was going to get a more newer model, which was a Honda Civic Type S. So now I've got a black bike and a black car. I'm a gangster. But you know what was more gangster than that? Riding out with the fucking man then. Some ride outs. Listen, the ride out 
workouts were off this fucking scale. Like, oh, man, I just my adrenaline is pumping thinking about it right now. I've been on ride outs where there's like 30 man deep on bikes and we go like, ah, oh, man. Listen, one time we went down to fucking Stevenage and there's like 30 of us riding bikes. And some of the men them got girls on the back and they're popping wheelies through the fucking tunnel. Let me tell you. Them feelings there, listen, that's you see me? I'd rather fucking ride my motorbike than go out on a date with a girl. Yeah. There's nothing no better experience than riding a motorbike. Let me tell you that right now. Yeah, we used to get a lot of attention riding in packs. Imagine you see like 30 men riding bikes, you're going to give them a lot of attention. To be fair, I used to get a lot of attention when I used to ride my bike on my own. And that was when the bike was even black. But when I sprayed my bike candy red, I shut it down. When I got that bike sprayed candy red, it was over. Man, shut down the road. Yeah. Let me tell you something. When you ride a sexy motorbike, it's the equivalent of being a pretty 10 out of 10 girl. Men will come up to you that you don't know. Random men, you know, will come up to you and start a conversation with you. You know how many times I've been on my bike and people are taking pictures of me. I don't know these people, you know. They're taking pictures of me. They put me on their Snapchat. The video, listen, that bike there yeah, attracts too much attention and sometimes the wrong attention. So back when, you know, them little idiots on their mopeds were going around robbing people for their motorbikes. A couple years ago. Around the Camden area, Islington area, Holloway area and Hackney area, that's a hot spot for all them foolishness. And it was one Friday night. Anyone know me, Friday night is bike night. I went down to Camden and I needed to use the toilet. So I've gone into one pub. I've left the bike on the side of the road on a single red line. Yeah? As I've stepped out of the pub, yeah, I'm just about to go and jump on my bike. A bunch of youths have turned up. Yeah? Couple of them on motorbikes, couple of them on mopeds, but there's at least like five or six of them. Yeah? Two of them has pulled up in front of my motorbike and the rest of them are behind my motorbike. But I'm not even thinking like they're gonna try and jack the bike or nothing like that. I've just jumped on the bike and gone about my business. And they followed me. But in the riding community, if someone's following you, it's not a weird thing, you know. If you're a rider right now, you will know what I'm talking about. You'll be on your motorbike and random riders are following you down the road. Because it's just one of them things. In the motorbike community, the rules are different. Yeah? But I'll, I'll touch upon that in a minute. Anyway, these youths are behind me now and they're proper watching the bike. But I'm just thinking like, yeah, they're just admiring the bike. And it was only a couple months after when someone told me about a story where someone got licked off their bike in Camden. I was thinking, wow, you know what? I bet their mutual was going to try it, but maybe they just thought, nah, we'll leave it or whatever, we'll go after someone else. But I think someone's going to try and jack me for my bike. The riding world and the driving world are two separate universes. There's certain things you can do in the riding world that you can't do in the driving world. There'll be times where I'll be riding my bike. I might be going down the A10 or the A406. I will see man on their bike on the opposite side of the road. Now, I don't do this, but other men them, every now and then, will turn their bikes around and start following me. Now, they're not trying to jack me or nothing like that. They're just riding with me. Now, obviously, if you was in your car and someone done that, you'd think they're trying to rob you, you'd probably call the police or something like that. Nah, when you're a rider, them things there is all right. More time, you might even pull over, exchange numbers with a man, and you'll be out in the next couple of weeks with his man, them on a rider. When you're a rider, you could be riding your bike, or you could just be at the traffic lights. You see another bike, give them a little nod. 
If you're a car driver, you don't do them things then. I can never imagine being in my Honda Civic and I see another Honda Civic driver and I give him a nod. Now, maybe if I was driving a Lamborghini and I saw another Lamborghini driver, then maybe. But other than that, I ain't giving no one an acknowledgement. Speaking of acknowledgement, if I'm a rider, if I'm on my bike and I'm riding down the road, if I see another biker stranded at the side of the road, I'll pull over. Now, if I'm on my bike or in my car and I see a car driver stranded at the side of the road, unless that person looks like they're in immediate danger, I ain't pulling over for them, innit? There's one thing you don't do when you're riding a bike. And if you're a rider and you're driving your car, you don't do this as well. When you see a biker in the right hand lane, you don't undertake bikers. Especially if they're on a bigger bike than you. Me personally, I don't undertake mopeds, I don't undertake no bikes. Now, if that rider is riding relatively slow, if I'm going to undertake him, I will rev up my engine, I'll beat my horn, I'll make sure he or she knows that I'm going to undertake them. And I'll undertake them. And I'll leave a nice big fat gap to show them some respect. So, in the riding world and the driving world, there's certain rules and regulations you need to follow. Now, just before I tell you about the road rage incident I had, let me tell you about the best race I've ever had on my bike. Now, I've had a couple of races on my bike. I remember one time I went down to Birmingham and on the way back, I had a race with a Nissan GTR and that guy fucked me up. Listen, obviously I've got a 600 and I've rode with like R1s, 1000 CC bikes and shit. And the power of this Nissan GTR, I don't think any R1s can keep up with Nissan GTRs, in it? But someone in the comment box below tell me if I'm wrong. But the best race I've ever had. Let me sit down for this one, hold on. Let me just adjust this camera now. Right, as I said, Friday night is bike night. And I have certain routes that I take. So I'll take the A406 and I'll go down towards the Blackpool Tunnel, so A12. And on my way back, they must have closed one of the tunnels on the A12. Not the Blackpool Tunnel, but a different tunnel. I'm riding back towards Walthamstow and Romford and Edmonton and that to try and join on to the A406. Now they closed the tunnels and I had to go over. I've gone over now and I've heard like a a supercharged car in the distance. So I'm thinking it might be like an M4 or a Nissan GTR or something like that. Anyway, obviously I'm on a bike, so I get to, you know, skip traffic and go ahead or whatever, isn't it? So I've gone up now. I'm looking for this car or whatever. I'm looking for like an M4 or a C63 Mercedes, something like that. Anyway, it was a Jaguar F-Pace, a 5 litre Jaguar F-Pace, it was like the supercharged one. Of, well they call it filtering, yeah? So you've got cars on each side and you go through the car, they call it filtering. I filtered through the traffic and I spotted the car, right? I'm gone past the car now and the driver starts switching lanes. And as soon as I see that, basically for me to initiate a race or I know a race is on, all I do is I look in my side mirrors and if I see cars start switching lanes like they're trying to speed up, I just put my hazard lights on and basically I'm saying, look, it's on now, isn't it? Yeah. So boom. So I put my hazard lights on. This guy's gone now. Yeah. So we're racing now. He's overtaking me and we're going around bends and that. So I'm not really doing more than 100 miles an hour on this road because the road's windy and shit like that. So anyway, he's ahead of me. And I've indicated left, hoping that he will see it, so he will go up the A406, because I'm going back home. Anyway, he's taken a left turn and he's gone up the A406 towards Wolverhampton and Edmonton. I've gone up, like, taken the left turn in, and emerged onto A406, and we're side by side at the time. And as soon as we got onto the flat straight road, that was it. We were gone. I was doing 140, 150 down this road. I'm talking about like the fucking handlebars are shaking because obviously the road's not flat. So there's certain times where you're going to 
be riding and the bike's coming off the ground and shit like that. Not wheeling, but obviously the road's not flat, but yeah? and you might go over a little hump and shit. The, the fucking, the, the handlebars are shaking and that, I'm bombing it down the road. This guy is on my tail, literally, like, we're bombing it down the road, doing 150 miles an hour, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that was the best race I've ever had. Man. Like my adrenaline was pumping, and like there were some black brothers in the car, and they were egging me on and shit like that. Ah, it was good fun, good fun, good fun, good fun. But now for the road rage incident. So I've never really been involved in any road rage incidents or nothing like that. I've never had to jump out my car and do a man something before, in it. Except for there's one time. So before I moved up to Northampton, I used to come up here periodically. I used to have to sort a little one, two problems here and there in my house. So I sorted out my business at my house and I'm making my way home. Now, from Northampton to Edmonton, it's like an hour and a half drive. And I thought, you know what, let me stop off in town and get a chicken burger from the chicken and chip shop that I usually go to. So boom, I've gone down to the main strip in Northampton now, where the chicken shop is. And let me just mention one thing about Northampton that I've seen in the last few years. Northampton has a uni and many students at Northampton Uni, they come from London. Now, when I first got my property three years ago, I was like the only black brother in town like that I saw. Every now and then I see one, two guys or whatever in it. Yeah? Now and then I see a few uni students and I know they're uni students, they're from London, they're up here in it. But in more recent times, I've been seeing men that I believe are actually from Northampton and like, you know, this is their ends or whatever. And I see a couple of men walking down the high street looking tough, but I don't business, isn't it? I know who I am and whatever, isn't it? Yeah, so I don't really pay them man attention. I just, it's just an observation I've just seen, in it? So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I'm a bad man everywhere, I guess, isn't it? So I'm driving down the high street now and I pass the chicken shop on my left. Look inside, cool, it's open, no one's in there. Let me just take this next left turn in. It's a dead end road. As I've turned down this dead end road, there's a cab driver on the corner and he's got his indicator on. So I'm driving down this dead end road. There's cars on the left and cars on the right. I'm thinking to myself, all right, cool. If there's no space for me to park at the bottom, I will take this cab driver spot because he's got his indicator on and he looks like he's about to move off. Went down to the bottom of this road and there's no space. So done a U-turn. Started driving back up this road to hopefully take this cab driver spot because he put his indicator on, so I'm assuming he's gonna move off this double yellow line. Now there's cars on the left, cars on the right. If you meet anyone in the middle, someone's gonna have to give someone way. So I've driven to the top of the road and I've lined up beside the cab driver and I gave him a gesture as to say, Are you leaving? And he said no. The guy put his indicator on as if he's gonna leave, but he's actually stationary, he's probably waiting for someone. So these times I'm at the giveaway line now. The main road's in front of me, cars are driving up and down or whatever. There's a Range Rover holding up traffic. He's waiting on me to leave this road, but I want to park on this street. This cab driver's giving me the wrong impression that he's gonna leave, so I'm thinking, oh, fuck, what do I do? So I thought, you know what? I'll reverse back and I'll double park. I'm only gonna be a minute or two and then I'll be out. No one will be blocked in or nothing like that. So I've started slowly reversing back to allow him to enter this road. This prick swings his car in. So now we are bumper to bumper. So I start reversing back slowly. This guy's basically driving on top of me, not giving me no space. So now he's pissed me off. As I'm reversing back, I'm winding down my window. Now he's wound down his window. He's got his girl in his car. I said to him, yo, relax. Out of nowhere, he's jumped out of his car. What? As soon as he's done that, a switch went off in my head. Undone my seat up. Then I bust my car door open. Then I stuck it all over him. Get back in your car, get back in your car, get back in your car. A man said it three times, fam. Get back in your car, get back in your car, get back in your car. Watch my man, watch my man's reaction. This is his reaction. His soul left his body like an angel. He went on this thing, fam. Like, I don't.
don't know what he was thinking. Like, I think he must have thought I was one of them Northampton man that he could try jump out on and stick it on. Nah, brother, I'm from Edmonton, fam. You ain't trying that shit with me. And I'm telling you right now, he's lucky I didn't have my team on me, you know. He's lucky I didn't aim at him, you know. He's lucky I have the Ross Clark gene like, to aim at his head, you know. I was just looking to get out of the car and choke his Ross Clark. You know them one day where you don't let a man go and tell him, scream? Help me. But anyway, I didn't put my hands on him. I didn't need to. I just sent him packing. He jumped in his car and he kept it moving. I reckon that is the last time he ever jumped out of his car on someone. He must have been so embarrassed. He was with his girl. He's in his car. He's stunting. He thinks he's a bad boy. He jumps out like he's hard. And he gets pricked. You can't blame him though. I guess he didn't know I was wearing a Stay Wise t-shirt underneath. Boy, if you're gonna jump out your car and act like you're hard, you best follow through with the thing. That's all I'm saying. No genie lamps will harm you in the making of this video. Stay Wise.